Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth Vantage seminar and the last in the series on uh, class groups. And uh, today we're very happy to have David Zurich Brown speaking about moduli spaces and arithmetic statistics. Oh, and uh, David, I, I just wanted to um, ask, is it OK if this talk is posted to YouTube afterwards? Yes, that is OK. OK. Thank you, David. That's very sweet. <laughs> um, great. Thank you. Uh, How is the volume? Uh, the, vo the volume great. is good. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, I hope that more seminars like this uh, start happening. Um, I put a link to my slides in the chat. Um, Hopefully everybody can access that. Um, if you can't, just go to my webpage and I have a link to slides of all of my talks and, and then these slides will be at the very top. Um, for my webpage, just Google DZB and then math and I'm the first hit. There's now a bank called DZB. So I'm no longer the first hit without math. Are the slides showing as well, the screen share? Yep, yeah, great. Uh, great. So, yeah, looks great. Uh, thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, recent joint work with Melanie Matchettwood and Yuan Liu. Uh, the paper is on the archive uh, and our web and on our web pages called "A Predicted Distribution for Galois Groups of Maximal Unramified Extensions," uh, and I'll split the talk about half and half between. Uh, the number, well, like the paper is, the number theory side and the function field side. And to be completely upfront, I was kind of the stacks ringer for this project. Um, and I'll explain what that means later. Uh, even though I do, you know, work on and enjoy purely number field cohen lenstra type problems, uh, the reason I'm a co-author is because there were some tricky things about stacks uh, and cohomology that I helped work out. Also, if I, uh, can you see my mouse on the screen share? No? Or yes? Okay, great. Uh, so here's the setup. You fix a finite group gamma. Uh, you should think of gamma as being, for instance, z mod 2z. And then for our statistics type problem, you, you fix q, say, and you vary a number field k with Galois group gamma. So for instance, if you vary z mod 2z extensions, this is varying over quadratic fields, you can add whatever other kind of constraints you like, real versus imaginary ramification conditions, especially at infinity, uh, and so on. And the, uh, so I wasn't able to make it to, I actually teach right now, and so I was able to, wasn't able to make it to the other talks, so I don't know how much of the, number field heuristics people discussed, but one of the classical problems is to ask, uh, so this is Cohen Lindstra and then Cohen Martinet, which is to ask how the class group of K is distributed. The first time I read about this problem was varying over imaginary quadratic fields. And by distributed, you can pick any statistic you like of a finite group and ask how that varies. So for instance, you could ask for the isomorphism class of the group itself, the P part, the torsion, uh, or somewhat equivalently, uh, the moments, so numbers of surjections to some given group, for example. So for the class group, which is abelian, and which is isomorphic to the Galois group of H over K, the Hilbert class field, this is, uh, in some sense, the classical problem that people have studied. So what we study in this paper is instead uh, this gigantic problem that dominates the abelian problem, which is to say, we ask how, again, as you vary k over gamma extensions, we ask how the maximal unramified extension of k varies. Uh, so the maximal unramified extension uh, might be infinite, uh, whereas the maximal abelian unramified extension is finite by class field theory. 
And uh, there's, there's a lot I need to say. So this is an infinite profinite group, and there are lots of questions you can ask about it. Uh, and for full disclosure, in the red, uh, for certain technical reasons, uh, at least in this first paper, uh, we work with the part that is prime, or coprime, rather, in the profinite sense to twice the order of gamma. Um, this simplifies uh, a few things for us. So I'll talk a bit more on the next slide about properties of K unramified, but the types of questions we want to ask are, well, how does K unramified vary? So is it finite or infinite infinitely often? How does the Galois group of K unramified over K vary? Uh, and how do we model this? So by model, in the cohen linster type problems, uh, you often find some either random matrix theory or random groups model. Uh, you answer the question of how, for instance, the P part of the class group of K varies for a random group, and then ask if uh, this matches up. So it's a bit of work now to work with a random profinite group. That's what the Galois group of K or over K will be. Uh, and it's not any random profinite group. Uh, kind of part of the point of this paper is identifying natural conditions that this larger Galois group uh, satisfies beyond being profinite. So this is the basic problem. Vary K, ask how the maximal and ramified extension varies. So a few quick comments on maximal and ramified extensions. So the maximal and ramified extension could be finite or trivial. So for Q, there are no unramified extensions, period. On the other hand, uh, what's more interesting is that the maximal and ramified extension can be infinite. And so in blue, there's this notion of a class field tower. If you start with a field K, you can take the Hilbert class field of K and then the Hilbert class field of the Hilbert class field and iterate this process and then take the union of these. So uh, the Galois group of, we'll call that union KH, the Galois group of KH over K uh, can be infinite. Uh, the great starting place to think about this is the golod shafarevich theorem. They gave certain criteria for KH to be infinite when K is our, a certain quadratic field or certain types of quadratic fields. Uh, and in general, they, there are lots of examples you can write. So for instance, if uh, you look at Q adjoin zeta 877 unramified, 877 is prime, that happens to be infinite. Uh, and in general, if you take Q adjoin zeta M, where M is divisible by at least eight distinct primes congruent to one mod L for some fixed L greater than two, then they show that that also has infinite class field tower. So these examples are somewhat special, um, but they're fairly explicit uh, as well. On the other hand, uh, uh, KH over K is solvable, again, in the profinite sense, simply because, well, here it is being solved uh, at each step, the Galois group of HI over HI minus one is abelian. On the other hand, there are non-abelian unramified extensions. So for instance, uh, the, according to some papers I found, conjecturally smallest extension where this happens is the quadratic extension Q adjoin root minus 1567. Uh, in this case, what happens is there's an S5 extension where uh, the ramific there is ramification, but it's somewhat minimal. Uh, its discriminant is divisible by the same primes as 1567, and the quadratic subextension eats up all of the ramification. So you have an S5 extension of Q, an A5 extension of this field K, which is unramified with non-solvable Galois group. Which is to say that it's possible that K unramified over K is infinite and not solvable. Um, so again, you could take K, an unramified, uh, non-solvable, in this case, simple extension, and then 
take the Hilbert class little towers over that. So uh, when I was preparing this talk, I asked Cam McLeeman at uh, University of Michigan Flint uh, about this problem a, a bit. So this is his famous problem. If you go to his webpage, he has a picture of a class field tower as soon as you land. Uh, and there's a lot that we don't know about k -er over k. So for instance, it's not, while it is not always true that k -er is not equal to kh, meaning some Hilbert class field tower, uh, as far as Cam and I know, all of the examples we have of an infinite k -er over k uh, come from maybe some single finite so, uh, not solvable extension, but then class field towers on top of that, which is to say it's unknown whether, uh, to our knowledge, it's unknown whether there's some k such that k -er over k does not contain an infinite class field tower. Okay, so that's a little bit of that background, things you can say about class field towers, uh, which, oops, um, I guess, all right, and then one other neat lemma, if you look at quadratic imaginary fields and look at the two part of the class group of K, uh, again, this is a theorem, I think of Golod and Shafarevich, that if the rank of the two part, so you may as well just think of the rank of the two torsion of K, the class group of K is at least five, so at least five cyclic factors, then KH is infinite. If it has, uh, well, one, two, or three factors, uh, it could be infinite or finite. And then actually, conjecturally, if the rank is four on the nose, uh, in every example we've looked at, the class field tower is infinite. Uh, and I think it's only conjectural uh, that for rank four, you get an infinite class field tower. So this is kind of the state of uh, what we know. And these constructions, like the K Q adjoins zeta M construction, are fairly special. Not enough to prove positive density results, uh, say. So how to model in the random matrix theory, et cetera, since the Galois group of K or, uh, well, again, I'm going to switch to the prime to twice order of gamma part. Uh, so this is a quotient uh, of the Galois group, but in general uh, can still be infinite. Uh, there's a lot of work on instead of class field towers, just P class field towers where you take the P part of the Hilbert class field. Um, and this group satisfies uh, an easy medium and difficult to see property. So K or, uh, it's not too difficult to see uh, that this is the, called the schur zassenhaus theorem, that it is a gamma group. Uh, so I'm gonna flip back, remember this diagram. Uh, oh, I should have written G there. So G is the Galois group of K or over K or at least the Galois group of this red part, uh, and then gamma acts on that. The way you should think about this is that, you know, if the Galois group of G, it, it can't really move H because it would send H, for instance, to some other unramified field extension of K. Uh, this, this is essentially where these actions come from. Uh, so it's not difficult to see that the group has a gamma action, already not a completely random group. Uh, it has an admissibility condition which is, in fact, these groups are generated by, well, topologically, so closure, uh, generated by elements of the form G inverse sigma G for G in the group and uh, gamma, sorry, not sigma, gamma and gamma. And then finally, uh, there's this more mysterious property E, uh, which says G has the following property. Uh, and to, to make this uh, sensible for a seminar talk, I, I am gonna cheat a little bit here, but you can see our paper for the longer statement, which is essentially, if you have a, an unrelated short exact sequence of gamma groups, so gamma acts on G prime, G prime tilde, and acts trivially on Z mod PZ. If you have a non-split such extension and a map from G to G prime, I think I want that to be a surjection, then it lifts to a G equivariant map to G prime tilde. So there's some kind of, you should think of this as a cohomological property, but there's some kind of splitting property that these exact sequences have. Um, 
So I came into this project after Melanie and Yuan had uh, isolated these properties as necessary, and I worked mostly on the function field side. But I can say, even though this looks kind of out of left field, uh, I, th I think it was really Yuan's idea that, so there are these uh, examples and heuristics from uh, Bush and Boston, so Nigel Boston, uh, for non-abelian cohen lindstrom heuristics, and there were certain groups that they could show did not occur even in finite non-abelian cases. And uh, after, so Yuan was actually Nigel's student, not Melanie's student. <laughs> And Yuan, uh, I think, figured out that this property E is what's going wrong, kind of unifies all of the examples uh, that didn't occur before. So when we model a group, we don't want to model just some random profinite group. We want a random profinite group with a gamma action admissible and want it to have property E. So one more slide and then I'll stop for questions. In the first half of our paper, and we actually break it into part one and part two, um, we produce a measure, actually a fairly computable and explicit measure, on the set of isomorphism classes of such groups, so groups satisfying these three properties from before. Um, and we make a conjecture that this Galois group equidistributes with respect to uh, this measure, use of gamma. And then in the, and that takes about half the paper uh, to set up this measure, prove that it's really a probability measure, basic properties, et cetera. And then, well, also to prove that uh, these groups satisfy property E. And then in part two of the paper, we set up the same problem in the function field setting uh, and uh, prove it in the Q goes to infinity. sense. So we show the conjecture is true for moments over FQ of T. This Q goes to infinity. Um, I want to comment quickly on the measure. So you can you can set up a notion of random profinite group on n generators, and you can build into your constructions the gamma action, and then consider random quotients by subgroups that look like this. Uh, that's kind of the first step towards building this measure. And then uh, you, you can do this explicitly with n generators uh, and then take, take a limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, okay, so that's the first part of the talk. Um, any, oh, uh, any questions? Kiran says that they lost and then uh, regained audio. It's, it's okay, I think they figured it out. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah we're, we're back now, sorry. Okay, great. A, I'm not sure what happened, but it was a local issue. Right? Mm -hmm. Cool, no worries. Great, any questions? Does the fact that it's true for moments imply the statement for the full distribution? Yeah, I think that's Aaron Landsman. Um, yeah. So for a probability distribution, that's the same. When I say true for moments, uh, it, it's not literally true uh, that it proves it for the, uh, in general, for the function field case. And part of that is because we're, when we say we prove it, we're taking some limit as Q goes to infinity. So not quite, but morally, we take this theorem as very strong evidence for our conjecture. Uh, and since our conjecture abelianizes to cohen lindstrom we take it as strong evidence for cohen lindstrom martinet as well. All right, part two. So uh, I'm the stack stringer of the project. And uh, the second half of the paper is about uh, this problem over function fields. So I was tempted here, instead of my own handwritten slide, to send you to this set of notes of Bjorn Poonen. Um, it's not linked to directly on his webpage, but if you go to his papers directory and just type in curves.pdf, this will be produced. Uh, this is my required reading for my own PhD students and my own uh, REU students. And it's basically 100 pages of uh, when I was a graduate student of Bjorn spoon feeding to us what he thought we needed to know 
uh, beyond uh, Hartshorn. So for instance, it talks about Riemann rock over non-algebraically closed fields. It talks about how to detect factors of an abelian variety over a finite field via zeta functions uh, and how to do computations. And he has this great three-page long table about the function field analogy that I recommend checking out. In any case, the quick version that I need here is simply that uh, finite extensions of Q or finite extensions of FQT are both global fields and behave effectively, effectively the same in many regards. Um, a finite extension K of FQ of T, uh, well, either you can extend the FQ, so FQ to the N, or it's the function field of some curve. FQ of T is a function field of P1. Um, and the, the brief version of the analogy is, well, the analog of the ring of integers is just C. The spec of O of K is one dimensional, as is a curve. The analog of the class group, well, it's not even just an analog, it's the same object. So the Picard group of C, divisors modulo equivalence, it's the same definition in each case. Um, so it's not just an analogy, it's the, the same object. Um, the analogy of the absolute discriminant, so the magnitude, is that's a G. So Q, the residue uh, size, to the G minus one, uh, where G is the genus. I think I want G, not G minus one there. And then the analog of the different is really the ramification divisor of the map from C to P1. So when we count uh, things based on different uh, or discriminant, that's roughly the same as counting the uh, genus. And then these other ways of counting, uh, I don't know if Melanie discussed this, and I glossed over this in the first half, uh, is that uh, we actually don't exactly count by a discriminant. There's some kind of smoothing process that I understand less well than they do, uh, where if you count by uh, the radical of the discriminant, or rather just the product of the ramified primes, uh, things seem to work better. Uh, so you can do the same here. In terms of uh, Hilbert class field and class field towers and so on, uh, it, it's easier to see what happens in the function field case. Uh, pick not of J uh, is just what's called the Jacobian of C. And uh, so I think, I think most talks should have a why bother slider too. Why bother in the function field case? A, I think function fields are just as interesting as number fields. Uh, but B, you can actually prove many of these theorems in the function field case. And the reason for this is that the Jacobian, so pick not of C, uh, is actually an algebraic variety. Whereas, uh, I mean, I, I've, tr I've tried with Jordan and others to come up with some possibly not variety, but stack, which models the class group and the number field case. Uh, and there are problems, uh, so it doesn't work. Uh, for the Jacobian, you know, once you fix the, look, let me just point out a few things. Once you fix the genus, there's a bound on the L torsion in the class group, just coming from the geometry. The Jacobian is a G-dimensional abelian variety, whereas that's not presumably true in the number field case. Similarly, if you vary the field from FQ to FQ to the N, you get injections on the FQ points of the Jacobian. But if you vary the field that you're taking the class group up, you generally don't get injections. So that's a good uh, cue that there's not a geometric object in the number field case that controls this. Or if there is, it's at least a stack rather than a scheme. So this is part one of why bother. But also, there's a map from C to its Jacobian. The Jacobian has plenty of unramified abelian maps. So isogenies, multiplication by uh, M prime to Q. Uh, and so you can generate just automatically infinite class field towers by pulling back maps on the Jacobian. And then it's not, it's also not as difficult to produce non-abelian unramified maps in the function field case by thinking about fundamental groups and so on. Finally, the reason the Jacobian is so useful is the Bay conjectures. So first of all, uh, the FQ to the end, because J is a variety, the FQ to the end points of J are the same as the FQ to the N bar points, which are fixed by Frobenius or Fraben. And uh, well, over a finite field, the Galois group is topologically cyclic 
in general, you need the points fixed by the full Galois group. Here, you can model the FQ to the endpoints of the Jacobian via the single matrix, which a priori lives in GL2G uh, of ZL. So, more generally, the vague conjectures say that the FP points of a variety X, in effects is not proper, you have to use compactly supported cohomology. This number, I mean, th this is a miracle. Explain this to somebody in analysis and, oh, look at you funny. It's uh, this alternating sum of traces of Frobenius acting on H1 et al. And uh, the reason this is useful is despite it's for, despite what it looks like at first, these H1 et al's are fairly computable. Um, in particular, uh, you have what's called proper base change. So if you reduce something mod P or base change to C, these et al cohomology groups become isomorphic to the uh, usual singular cohomology from our graduate course in topology. And flushing through here, um, pick not of C, or at least the L part, is you can check, I mean, there's, there's some work to go from this line to this line, is the co-kernel of Frobenius minus the identity, the co-kernel you know, on the space of matrices. Um, and so A, this, this identification lets you prove some theorems about L-torsion in class groups over function fields, uh, but it also facilitates the random matrix side as well. So this matrix F, again, a priori, is an element of, so L, is an element of GL, 2G of ZL, and you can ask, forget about geometry, if I, well, there's a natural measure, our measure on GL, 2G of ZL, although the measure is essentially given by looking at congruence classes, and you can ask a purely random matrix theory question, which is, what's the average value of that co-kernel? Or the easier one to answer, is how, what's the probability? How often will that co-kernel be isomorphic to a given L power abelian group, capital L? And uh, the answer is just like cohen Luster, it's one over ot of L. But the neat thing is this is really, there's no conjecture here, this is an honest to goodness theorem about matrices. Um, I should say, in reality, uh, the, uh, yeah. In reality, there's a Vey pairing on the Jacobian, so there's a pairing, and Frobenius actually lives in GSP, so the generalized symplectic group 2G of ZL, uh, and you can you can prove uh, you can try to prove similar types of theorems uh, for GSP instead of GL. And uh, finally, it's not completely a random matrix. The Vey conjectures tell you that the eigenvalues of F are algebraic and integers with complex absolute value given by the Vey conjectures, so, so two, two root Q to some I. Um, I guess I is one half here. And uh, so they're not completely random, but again, this, this theorem doesn't see that. And we can still make conjectures based on, based on this. So, uh, I really like, for, for a while, Jordan Ellenberg was calling this topological analytic number theory. Uh, but by the time the, he spoke at the Arizona Winter School, he started calling this instead just geometric analytic number theory. And I really like, uh, so I recommend his lecture notes from the Arizona Winter School, uh, which are about 30 pages, but then also there are some other survey papers that he cites. You can spend quite a lot of time. Uh, reading about this. So uh, I really like his starting example, which is the most complicated calculation of the number of square free monic polynomials of degree n. So fix Q and look at polynomials in FQ of X, so one variable over FQ, and let SQ, SFQ of n be the number of square free monic polynomials of degree n. Now, there are uh, Q to the, what, N plus one? Yeah, Q to the, sorry, Q to the N monic polynomials. And this says almost all of them are square free. And this is something that uh, you can do purely combinatorially. There are elementary proofs of this. Uh, we're going to prove this via the Bay conjectures. 
quick note, if you divide by the total number uh, the, of monic polynomials, not necessarily square free, then, uh, so if you want to get a proportion, you get one over Q minus one, which is the same as the zeta function of A1 of FQ evaluated at two inverse. Uh, a couple of comments about this. Uh, so one, I mean, the zeta function of P1, hopefully we're happy with, you have a numerator, you have a denominator, uh, it's a rational function. A priori, you define the zeta function as an infinite product over closed points of some variety. And then one big difference between the number field and function field case is that the zeta functions are rational functions. And here, it's a very simple rational function. Remember, it's A1 rather than P1, which is why we only get this one term. And this is the same theorem that you get for square free integers over Q. It's uh, six over pi squared, which is one over zeta two. Um, so let's see, we have a few more minutes. Um, let's talk about how to prove this using geometry. So conf n of x is the configuration space of x. What is a configuration? It's simply an unordered n-tuple of points. So it's uh, distinct points. So if you want an ordered tuple of distinct points, you would look at x to the n and then remove the big diagonal. So just the diagonal of you know, tuples where there's something repeated. And then if you want them to be unordered, you quotient by the symmetric group. Uh, maybe I wanted that in as a subscript. The action of the symmetric group on x to the n minus the diagonal is free because we've removed the parts that are fixed. Great, so this quotient for any x really models, I mean, the points of it are unordered in tuples. Um, at least, if X is a topological space, if we're working with a scheme, so I want to go through this slowly and highlight this. For a scheme uh, over here in the red, Y, oops, for a scheme Y, the K points of Y are the K bar points of Y, which are fixed under the absolute Galois group. That should be a lowercase k. So in particular, the K points of conf n of a1 are the k bar points of conf n of a1, which are invariant under the Galois group. Which is to say, uh, this is what I want to emphasize, the tuple, al unordered tuple, alpha 1 through alpha n, we don't ask that the individual alpha i's be defined over k, we just ask that the Galois orbit of the alpha i's are defined over k. And uh, that's forced upon us by this fact. The fact that this is a variety implies that the correct calculation of the K points is the Galois invariant K bar points, just like divisors, just like points on the Jacobian. And then uh, you can, so over K instead of FQ, uh, this is in bijection in a natural way with the square free polynomials. If you have an n-tuple of alphas, you can send this to the product of x minus roots. This polynomial will have coefficients in k because of the Galois invariance of the alpha i's. On the other hand, if you have a polynomial with k coefficients, uh, you get roots, but the roots do not have a natural ordering on them. Great, so our problem is to count the number of fq points on conf n of A1, and Jordan's most difficult calculation of this fact ever is the following. By the Bay conjectures, this is an alternating sum of traces of Frobenius acting on H1 et al, compactly supported, it's uh, not proper. And what happens is uh, you can compute this H1 et al over C, because this configuration space is something that makes sense over any field scheme or ring. And over C, uh, this configuration space, or at least its cohomology, has a really nice description. So first of all, 
uh, the H0 and H1 are both isomorphic to Q, and the higher HIs are zero. So first of all, this tells us that in this alternating sum, uh, the simplest possible thing more or less happens, which is you get a one-dimensional vector space, a one-dimensional vector space, and a bunch of zeros. And so for these traces, you get a trace and then minus another trace. And moreover, since these are one-dimensional vector spaces, you don't have to worry about what the eigenvalues of Frobenius are, aside from maybe their sign. Uh, and the reason you get Q to the n's is because here it's compactly supported, uh, and this is A1. So you have to worry a little bit about what the weights are. Uh, but you really get Q to the n minus Q to the n minus 1. So the question is, why do you get uh, Qs and zeros here? Uh, so the easier part is H0. That just counts the number of components. Uh, when you remove this diagonal and then quotient by Sn, you, you only get one component. So it's not a surprise that connected components. So it's not a surprise that you get Q here. Uh, for H1, this is my favorite part, uh, Benson Farr gave a joint meetings address about this, and he actually had videos explaining how uh, pi 1 of the configuration group is the braid group. But unlike this video, that will not, it's not publicly available after the talk. Uh, so what is a loop on configuration space? Well, just think about n equals 3 for a second. So I'm going to gesture enthusiastically about this. You start with three points, and as you travel around configuration space, if you have a loop, this gives you some movie where these points move around, and then if it's a closed loop, they end up back where they started, but in possibly some other position. Benson's movie for this was great. You get this. And uh, in particular, a loop on configuration space gives you a braid. It's a rearrangement of these three or n many points. Uh, and conversely, a braid gives you an element of pi 1. Great. We have generators and relations for the braid group. H1 is dual to the abelianization of pi 1, and you can just look at the presentation of the braid group and check that its abelianization is Z. Uh, and then you're over Q, so you tensor up to Q. So the point is, this description uh, of the algebraic topology of configuration space gives you a way to calculate not just hi over c, but by proper base change, hi tall over fp. So let me pause for questions again. Is there an easy geometric is there an easy geometric description of what this um, homomorphism from the braid group to Z is? Oh, um, I think it's the number of crossings. Uh, but that's sense. not quite right, is it? Yeah, you probably want the sign, do the number yeah, of crossings with sign or something like that. Well. So when N is 2, the braid group is just Z on the nose because you keep track yes, of it. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, I think so. I think it should be related to crossings, although I'm confused. To, yeah, sign, it's the number of sign crossings. That's what it is. Can, can you say again why there wasn't an analog of pick in the number field case? You said well, something first wasn't of injective. All, yeah, sure. Thanks. thanks. So for, first of all, uh, yeah, if you have a variety and you have an injection of rings R to S, then you get an injection of you know R points to S points. Uh, conversely, uh, you can have prime I, you can have extensions of number fields and a prime ideal on the bottom number field which is not principal but which becomes principal upstairs so this just tells you you know right off the bat that uh, it can't be an algebraic variety because the map from class group of K to class group of L is not injective actually I think every prime ideal becomes principal in the Hilbert class fields, which is not obvious. Uh, great. great, that sounds great. All right, All right. Uh, so final 10 minutes. There's actually one detail I left off here, which is why are the HIs for I at least two trivial? 
well, uh, you have an unramified cover, which is Xn minus delta. And so you can really just work with X. I mean, in this case, Xn, this is going to be C, or rather A1 of C, but C. Uh, so it, it's kind of like checking that uh, uh, pi 2 of an elliptic curve is trivial. Um, you can pass to a universal covering space and calculate there. Um, and then there's this theorem of Hrebich, which says that essentially uh, the first, the hi and the pi i's match up up to and including the fir first non-zero. Uh, anyway, so you can compute that way. Fairly explicit. All right. So, one second. What do we do? And what do Ellenberg, Vinkatesh, and Westerlin uh, do in their series of papers? Uh, so instead of configuration space, we work with Hurwitz spaces, and I'll explain what the decoration means in a second. Um, so configuration space was just a collection of marked points. Per GN, excuse me, is going to parameterize, well, the, the objects that we're studying in Cohen Lindstrom, these counting problems we're going to parameterize uh, a map from X to P1, and I'm, I'm not uh, decorating P1, so th this makes sense over any base scheme and any setting you like, um, although we'll apply this over the complex numbers and over finite fields. And remember that counting number fields, so maps F to P1, uh, that's, uh, th that's what we want to count in cohen lundstra type problems. Um, and then we need, we need some extra data. So uh, we want the automorphism group of X to P1 to be G. So we really want to count, at least in this setup, uh, Galois extensions with Galois group G. And we keep track of a little bit more. We keep track of uh, not just the fact that the Galois group is G, but we keep track of a particular isomorphism between the Galois group, so the automorphism group of this map, and the group, group G. So these are our objects. And then uh, these break up into lots of connected components that I'll explain. <laughs> but uh, first and foremost, uh, you can keep track of the number of ramification points, and that will uh, give you different components of her. So as a first pass, her GN, the map to confin sends X to P1 to the ramification locus. That's the same N. Um, in general, these are stacks, which are not schemes. Uh, our reference for this is Stefan Weber's thesis, uh, and there's a lot that's been written since then. And uh, on the other hand, uh, fun exercise, if you like these things, which I do, is that uh, an object like this can have automorphisms, which is why it's a stack rather than a scheme, uh, but the automorphisms are the center of G. So if G is centerless, so uh, the opposite of Z mod 2Z, uh, then you get a scheme which is, or a stack which is a scheme, and in general you get stacks here. Um, in our paper, we keep track of uh, what's happening at infinity. So this star, uh, we just ask this map, X to P1, to be unramified at infinity, and in fact, we mark a point over infinity. So the effect of marking a point, well, A, this is kind of like asking that the extension be split at infinity, uh, which is, you know, an, an extra condition here. Uh, and then and second, keeping track of that marked point in infinity actually kills off the extra automorphisms so that this becomes a scheme. Now, hopefully in, in a future paper, uh, we'll throw away the marked point and just work with the stacks, but it's a little bit of work to show that, well, first of all, if you know how these things go, that you get a scheme rather than an algebraic space, um, and just kind of to, un to understand this as a scheme. Next, even when you fix n and this marked point, these Hurwitz spaces still break up into lots of components. So uh, here's the easiest first uh, stab at components. So take a multi-set of conjugacy classes of G, uh, of size n, I didn't write that, and above each branch point, 
you get inertia. So this either means what you're used to in the number field case. If you're in topology, uh, you take a loop and you see what happens over a ramified point. Uh, or in the function field case, it's still a global field. So uh, inertia is some element of the Galois group and you uh, keep track. So the inertia that you get over each point, although you can't, you still can't order, it's configuration space, you still can't order each ramification point. Uh, this is why, uh, anyway, so this is why you get a multi-set rather than an order tuple. And uh, these also give you components of her. So the main point in what we do in part two of this paper uh, is summarized as follows. So if we take these Hurwitz schemes, uh, and I, I'll, I'll put a C here, but we're still keeping track of the marked point at infinity. Uh, if you keep track of these schemes, sorry, if you keep, uh, if you let G be H semi-direct gamma, and what we want to think about is gamma is the same gamma as before, and then H is going to correspond to some unramified cover, um, that roughly uh, FQ points of these Hurwitz schemes and their components are going to correspond to surjections from the Galois group of, so I wrote non-bold Q, Q bar over Q, but where Q is this FQ of T, to uh, this group. So if we, so the main point is if we want to prove a statistical theorem about moments, and to be honest, I need to decorate this a little bit more. So I didn't put in the co-prime to twice order of gamma here, that should be there. Uh, or I didn't incorporate the C into these projections, but the, the real starting point of part two, and it takes a little work to check this rigorously, like why is the H part of this extension a tall, say, that uh, the moment version of our counting problem is equivalent to finding rational FQ rational points on these Hurwitz schemes. Now, uh, again, giving a cover is the same as giving a surjection of fundamental groups. That's really where this comes from. Um, and then beyond that, uh, the theorem that kind of powers everything is that uh, kind of like square-free polynomials and computing the cohomology of configuration spaces via the braid group on the nose, well, this her maps to configuration space. And uh, that map is, uh, in general, if we invert enough uh, in the right setting, a tall. So we get some surjection from the fundamental group of configuration space corresponding to this cover. Uh, well, not quite a surjection. So these components, these her n g comma c's, these further break up into connected components that are more mysterious to us. And moreover, working over FQ, um, you might have, uh, the, the components are very confusing. So what I mean is, this will break up into some components which are uh, not the same as the geometric components, i.e. it might break up into some geometrically connected components over FQ, but then some orbits of components over FQ to the R, i.e. the geometrically connected components might not be defined over FQ. I'll explain why this is a problem, but on the other hand, uh, our observation is that we can actually compute the different components of these Hurwitz spaces over FQ, or meaning understand which fields they're defined over, and so on, uh, by understanding uh, an action of the braid group, the fundamental group of configuration space. And by compute, it, it, I mean, you, you can draw pictures and, uh, and deduce things from it. Uh, and then on the other hand, it, it really is true that these Hurwitz schemes uh, break into lots of different components that are not all defined over Q. If you look at our complete statement of this in section 10 of our paper, it looks fairly technical. Uh, but we, you know, we have a comment there that it's technical, but it's the truth. This is really what these Hurwitz schemes look like. You can, you can access information about them, but there really are lots of components defined over different extensions. And that's something you have to account for. Uh, so in the paper, we account for that. Uh, and I guess final point, why, why do we care about components? Well, if you want uh, 
a crude version of this problem where you let Q, I don't mean crude in a bad way, this is the, the easier version, where you let Q go to infinity, um, you get a lot of information uh, in terms of point counting by understanding how many connected components these spaces have and what fields they're defined over, as well as their dimensions. Um, so for instance, uh, if it's dimension one and the Q limit, you almost don't care what genus it is, you just care that it's dimension one and defined over uh, FQ. Uh, great, so it's 150, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, that, that was a wonderful talk, David. And um, I'd also like to ask everybody to fill out the survey, which was a uh, link was sent out in the email, and I'll also put it on the web page. Um, uh, so now we're open for questions. <laughs> uh, any questions from the East Coast? <laughs> Any questions from the Midwest? <laughs> okay, the Mountain West. <laughs> well, someone's got to come up with a question. All right, well, I, so I, I guess this is sort of a vague question, but I was trying to understand a little bit more about how the really the group theory of G and the braid group um, kind of, like, I, there sort of seemed like there are a lot of things that that you must have had to deal with there. And uh, I wonder if you could just add a little bit about that. Yeah, let me pull up. So what I wanna say is Melanie identified uh, these certain uh, invariants of the components uh, of Okay, so we've identified a few invariants already. So in uh, these conjugacy classes, but these have multiple components. Um, yeah, so Melanie identified these other component invariants of the components uh, that involve uh, how to say uh, the the way it involves G. I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but as she says, it's the truth. You can kind of write down this group, which formally uh, how to say. This group, uh, this group ring uh, indexed by elements of G, but where you add in extra relations based on how the braid group acts, and that certain invariants of that group ring construction give us invariants of components of her in G comma C. Um, that's still a bit vague, but uh, Melanie wrote a separate paper uh, which is much shorter, explaining what these component invariants are. It's just called, uh, the file's just called components. Um, and this comes from work of, what are the names? This comes from, and, and we're really, and the thing is we're really doing this over Z and over finite fields, but this comes from, oh, I see why I can't. comes from work of Reed and Volokhin. Forgot the other name. Um, so, yeah, great. Um, it's a bit technical, so I won't explain more, but this is a good pointer from that. So our, our, my starting point for understanding this were these papers of Freed and Volokhin. Great, and uh, let's see, any questions from the, the West Coast? Or from um, outside the United States? <laughs> Ask a question again from earlier. Sure. So in the, it's about these moments determining the distribution. So in the co usual cone Leinster heuristics, the moments do determine the distribution. And I was wondering if in your profinite version, the non-abelian version, do the moments still determine the distribution, or to what extent do they? Got it. Um, I I believe the answer is that the way we've set it up, because we're taking this Q limit, 
they don't literally uh, determine the distribution, but that's simply because it's not a literal distribution in the same sense that like a hard measure on GL 2G of ZL is actually a measure in a distribution. So I, I don't think, I would go even further, and, or at least to me, I would say it doesn't completely make sense to say it determines the distribution. On the other hand, you can ask questions like, if I know cohen lindstra for quadratic imaginary fields, uh, if I know the statements about the moments for every, you know, every, everything possible, do I know every type of group theoretic statement I would know? Do I know full cohen lindstra And it's not, maybe that's true, but that's not obvious to me. And in the function field case, because we're taking this Q limit, I, it's definitely not true. But that's, okay, all, that's all I can yeah, really safe. All right, well, thanks, Stephen. <laughs>